nakedness, Lord, what shall I wear? I can tell you that before I was converted, I didn't know what to wear. But as the Lord revealed to me what not to wear, I obeyed. And he gradually showed me. I want to give you one more little story, which is in harmony with the subject, which we're going to cover today is nakedness. I had been baptized and I gave all my fancy clothes away uh, to some thrift shop or something and real, real short clothes. And I had a tight skirt that was about to the knee, right to the knee when I stand up. But what happens when you sit down, ladies? It goes way up. Mine was going to mid thigh. So I was sitting in church and I was endeavoring. So just space bar to move it forward. Space to move back. Okay. okay. Thank you. I was endeavoring to keep myself modest. And in the Manhattan Seventh Day Adventist Church, there was a little Caucasian girl. She had hair all the way down to here. I'll never forget her. I don't remember her name, but she changed my life. And she had on a skirt that was midi length. It wasn't quite all the way down, but it was almost all the way down. She looked like an angel to me. And here I am, you know, sitting back there, pulling, 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 and I couldn't pull it down. And all of a sudden, I heard the Lord speak to me and say, you're naked. I said, naked? You're right. I am, and I have nothing to cover myself with. And I started crying. She went on and got baptized, but the Lord said, you need to look like her. And I said to myself, well, if I go all the way down, there's no place else to go. So I went down in the basement of the church. I ran out of the church before everybody else came out. And I sat on the steps, and I asked the Lord to forgive me. Forgive me for my nakedness. I realized I was naked. This was a new thought to me. But I understood when the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said that. You're naked? Cover up. So soon as church was over and Rick came out, we, were, um, we had a restaurant in New York City in the early 70s. And they told us it was the first restaurant, plant-based, vegan restaurant since Ellen White's day. No other. It was just uh, dairy restaurants in New York City, and it was a one macrobiotic restaurant. So this was a Seventh-day Adventist restaurant. We opened up by faith. That's a whole nother story. But I said, take me to the restaurant, because I remember there's a long skirt there, and I'm going to put that on, and I'm not taking it off. And that's going to be my uniform every day now. So that's how I found dress reform. Then later I studied in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. All these principles are in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. We're going to close today with a story of one of our employees. Because even though I didn't understand dress reform, I knew since we were Christians and we had a business, that people were going to come there dressed all kind of ways, in tight pants, mini skirts, because I did it. But I said, in order to um, not deal with that problem, everybody has to have a nice, flowing, long skirt. And this was their uniform. Then they put a long apron over it, or a white apron if they worked in our food production company. Well, I'm going to tell you the story at the end about this one lady that challenged me severely and how it ended, OK? So, let's start with, um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so I don't need to move this then. So, let's start with some text from the Bible. And I want to start with John 3, 3 first. <coughs> and here, <coughs> Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. <coughs> what did he say? You must be born again. Yeah. This is the crux of the matter. This is why the wheat and the tares are in the church. Because many people, Ellen White says, 
try to join themselves to Christ when they have not separated themselves from the world. And you can't do that. You at least have to be willing to change when Christ brings it to your mind. You have to have a different nature. You're not going to walk into heaven with the nature that you have. Your nature must be changed because remember, we are sinners. Did you forget that? I remember it every day. I'm a sinner saved by grace. The grace, the mercy. What is the grace of God? His power. Not just his unmerited favor, but his power. And so Christ gave me the power as I cooperated with him to change into his image. It's pretty simple if you want to do it. You just have to be willing, willing to change. And you know why I cried yesterday when I was reading my testimony? Because I realized that that was me, but I don't recognize that anymore. And it's painful for me to realize that I was like that. It's so painful. Because I remember what my mind was like. It was total darkness. I had a brother that died before. I thought he was with me all the time and I talked to him. But when I understand the dead know not anything, and when they're dead, they're really dead, guess what? He never talked to me anymore. He never talked to me anymore. And when I told the Lord, because I was getting too deep into show business, singing, everywhere, modeling, acting. I said, Lord, I can't talk to you anymore. What did that mean? I, it just meant saying, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep and the Lord's prayer. That was praying. I didn't know you could talk to God like a friend. So I said to, to the Lord one night, Lord, I can't talk to you anymore. <clears throat> and jump right in the bed. Next night, I said the same thing. Lord, I can't talk to you anymore. This is, you know, I'm deciding one way or another, and I'm, I'm, not, gonna de I'm not deciding for you. The third night, I got because I, I had a habit of kneeling by my bed. Third night, I said, Lord, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. And right then, my legs felt like lead. And I started crying, and I said, Lord, I, I think I need you in my life. I don't know why, but I think I need you in my life. And so I said, now I lay me down to sleep, and I said the Lord's Prayer, and I got in the bed, and I felt better. Well, I'm trying to make a point here. The unconverted, in my condition, I was no more ready to go to heaven than those people there in the church in 1888. The servant of the Lord said there was no preparation on their part for heaven. There was no putting away of sin. There was no sanctification. That was the part that was left out of the 1888 message. And it's the same today in the church. In order to preach or teach or live sanctification, you almost have to go underground. They don't want to hear it in the churches. The devil has fooled the majority of Christians to believe that they can be saved in their sins, not from their sins. But Jesus came to save us from our sins, didn't he? Yeah, did. Amen. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 10, 31. It says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Is that right? That's right. Does that mean dress? Yes. Absolutely. When you take that word glory and match it with the first angel's message, then you understand what fearing God and giving glory to him really means. It means doing his will. Why? Because the judgment has started. Not what you think 
you should eat and when you should eat and what you should wear, but what God wants you to wear. And that's a whole different story. It's as far from night and day. And when I came in this church and started reading the testimonies, I said, Lord, where are the people that do this? Where are the people that do this? And then I realized I couldn't look to the left or to the right. I had to have myopia vision. What's myopia vision? Huh? Myopia is tunnel vision. You don't look to the left or to the right. You just keep going. That is what I made up my mind I would do. I would look at the people. I would look at his word and the spirit of prophecy. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. What does that say? Hmm? And I pray God your whole body and spirit and soul be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. Is that what it says? Faithful is he. This is the part I like the best. Faithful is he which calleth you who will what? Also do it. This is not, this is not a, um, you know, righteousness by faith is so beautiful because God promises to do it in us. All he needs from us is our surrender, our obedience, our cooperation. Call it whatever you want, but we have a part and God has a part. Amen. That is what is missing in the gospel. That is the everlasting gospel. You have a part and I have a part. Without my part, I cannot be what God wants me to be. Otherwise, we're once saved, always saved, and Jesus died for the whole world, so we're all going to blast off for heaven. What happened to that statement? Ellen White said, if you're waiting for the whole church to be converted, what did she say? That day will never come. That day will never come. So this is an individual work, isn't it? Yes. It's an individual work. And when are you going to take it up? Today. If not now, when? Right. If not, you who? Mm -hmm. As each of us take up this work individually, if you're waiting to see so if somebody else is obeying, you'll never get the latter rain either. But all those people who are humbling themselves and praying and agonizing over their sins and agonizing for the Holy Spirit in their lives, because it can't happen without the operation of the Holy Spirit working with your decision and applying the merits of Jesus Christ. And so the Lord is going to make a transformation so that there is not spot or wrinkle or any such thing in all of our lives. It looks like an impossibility, but what is it called? Righteousness by what? You don't see it, but you have to believe that it's going to happen in your life or it will never happen. That is the first step to believe that it is going to happen. Now, I want to share with you some important principles on nakedness. And I'll tell you just right up front. Nakedness, partial nakedness, half nakedness, little bitty, 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 bitty bit of nakedness, it's all unacceptable to God. I'll explain what that means. Oh, I'm full of stories the Lord is bringing to my mind this morning. <laughs> we, my husband and I went to Columbia University one time. Walter Ray was there with the white lie. And we said, we can't let this go without somebody protesting it. So there was a book put out called The White Truth. You remember that? It counteracted the white lie. We went up there and we, we were passing out the books to everybody as they were going in and coming out. One of the people coming out looked at me and said, Hmm, you dress like that all the time? Yes, I do. <laughs> you don't have to do that. <laughs> My husband was standing right. He said, well, what is she going to do? He says, I was at a nudist camp this summer. 
Seventh-day Adventists, I was at a nudist camp, and we had lots of fun. And you know what? That's acceptable to God, too. I'm telling you, sometimes if we don't follow the truth, our minds